if you don't mind, I would start talking. If you've got a question, um, feel free to find a good slot to ask it. Um, please interrupt me during the talk, that should not be much of an issue. After all, I'm here to answer your questions and give you an insight into the KVM use cases in the container world. Um, I am myself, I'm Fabian Deutsch, I'm working at Red Hat on virtualization for the last six years. Um, I started with Overt, but that's pretty across the stack, so I worked on Fedora, on packaging, on the low level tuning. It's pretty interesting work. I really liked uh, what I do, and I still like what I'm doing today. So what am I doing today? Um, I'm working on the context of, um, of virtualization the, in the container context, so with containers and how do they fit together. But be before we get to that meat, or a vegetarian option might be, I don't know, hummus, um, Qmu KVM. Um, who of you does not know Qmu KVM? Ah, very good. So, um, a stronger together and that for quite a few years. I think Qmu.net came up with KVM and Qmu even predates that, right? Both of them are, I've got that screen here, both of them are very versatile components and they're battle tested. I mean, they are appearing in a range of products of companies. So OpenStack is using Liver, Qmu, KVM, and we've got Overt from Red Hat, but all the others, they are used in the cloud to support all those cloud workloads. So they're really, they, they did their mileage. Um, they provide machine level abstraction, a strong isolation. All of you could probably find more attributes describing what Qmu and KVM can deliver to you. So, but then, I mean, they empowered all of our workloads for so long, and then containers came along like three or four years ago. And they, and today, you know, everything is containers. If you go to KubeCon, which exploded from, I don't know, 1,500 people two years ago to 7,000 people. Um, and this year, I guess, uh, KubeCon, then it's pretty much like what we see with open, or we saw with OpenStack, right? And the question is, what about virtualization? I mean, with KVM Forum here, which is a nice venue, it's a nice place, great to be in Edinburgh. Um, but where do we see KVM? I mean, KVM it really showed, it proved that it's useful. We all know what we, what values we have from Qmu and KVM. Does it have any place in the container world or can we just get rid of it? I mean, it's easy to deprecate code. We need to do some discussions of how to deprecate stuff. But in the end we could say, right, containers are, are there to stay. We can address all of the, our use cases with containers. So let's get rid of KVM, Qmu and so on and so forth. Right. Um, and to answer that, we need to see at what do containers actually give to us? Why are they so successful and what, what makes them different to VMs? Um, so I think one of the things which makes containers so attractive is that they focus on the applications and, and the user workflows. So VMs were good, right? VMs were good in that sense that they allowed us to petition a host, a node. With, with VMs, specifically on Linux, with KVM and QEMU, it was so easy. I still remember with KVM, I don't know, 06 or what it was back then. You know, you launch QEMU in another QEMU instance and you had two VMs on that same node. Uh, Co-located with different services, that was so, so nice. Um, but in the end, you had to have the knowledge of how to set up the operating system, how to automate all that stuff. So it's a developer who wanted to use a virtual machine and the developer is in the end the guy who's developing the application for, for, for some use case, right? He had to know a lot of that stuff. He had to know the operating system, eventually how to debug grub booting errors or funny, I don't know, uh, flags when booting uh, the VM. And containers removed quite a bit of that burden. And even more, Qmu KVM focused much around about running the VM, but how do we get there? How is the image created? How does the content get into the image? Tooling was created. Guestfish helped us to build images and we got other tooling like Cloud Init allows us to modify content in a VM to, to personalize instances. But that all grow over time. With containers, um, that was a smart move to, to define that flow of how to create it and to run it. They, they did that very well. And that attracted developers because that burden, you know, all that operating system burden was not something the developer himself or herself had to care about. So that's why there's this smaller sentence at the end, admins enjoy virtualization because they really got the power, I should rephrase it, got the power to, to define the VM 
And developers really enjoy more containers because they don't have to worry about the operating system. They want to focus on their application. Now, Cave and Puma were there, but they weren't chosen to be the solution or the technical implementation to deliver this new user experience. All of this was brought to you by the new technology, which had no bugs and it was so, so great, you know, it could solve everything. Um, it was brand new. Well, not so brand new because it was picking up some existing kernel features like C groups and namespaces. Sure, that grow over time, grew over time, and um, is today much richer than it was two or three years ago. But there were very few overlapping things between virtual machines and containers. Now, fast forward today. We said containers came up and they addressed use cases. Where do we stand today, actually, after these two or three years of experience? So today, it's not that we have a single container running on a single host. No. Um, <coughs> instead, um, we have multiple containers running on a host. And that not only, you know, that's not helpful. <laughs> ah, very nice. Thank you. Um, we've got multiple containers running on a single host, and usually that's not even useful. So what appeared is a container orchestrator which is managing a cluster of hosts for you to run containers for multiple tenants. So actually that was fast forward into what we know with or what we have seen with VMs, right? We have large cluster managers like OpenStack where you can workloads from multiple tenants. That's actually where containers are today. OpenShift or Kubernetes, Tectonic, all those are, are distributions of Kubernetes, for example, which is one container orchestrator, um, allow you to run containers in production for multiple tenants. So from the high level, today we are where we were with, I don't know, where we were with BERT like two or three years ago, being <coughs> able to run workloads of multiple tenants on a single cluster in a production style manner. But containers in production environments have production critical problems. So like four or five years, or three or four years ago, <coughs> containers were new and they were driven by companies like Docker, and, and they could run their production workloads on containers because, because they knew them inside out, right? But it was very hard for customers to run, to run their workloads inside containers because there was no knowledge around them. Today, it's different. Today, with Kubernetes, we have well-defined orchestrators which can run containers. And because we're now running containers in production, we also gain more experience of how containers behave in, uh, in production. And People, know, uh, people learned quite a lot in the recent years. And, and that's now, after ramping up the talk and looking you know, where containers came from, um, that's, I think, where we can start to compare. So some of the problems we see in, in production is that people realize, which who run containers, huh, workloads, you know, can be insecure, right? There's that GitHub repository which somebody committed or pushed a PR to and we merged it. Now this is run on my host alongside my, my Oracle database or Microsoft database to you know maintaining our billing or whatever. And you know, they're just separated by namespaces. Oh well, and you know, I did, I did that uh, shared mount between these two namespaces. So how secure is that after all? So people started to worry about, you know, the isolation features of containers. Are they really, are they really strict? Are they as strict actually as, you know, that other uh, thing here, how was it called? KVM, KVM Cumu, right? They gave us a strict separation between tenants on a single node. Can containers actually provide the same feature set from that perspective? Um, so that is one thing that really came up and, and is an issue today. If you run containers, um, you have to ask yourself, what kind of workload do I run on a node in a container and how do I separate that? That's not even an issue for, for setups where you have multiple tenants, but it's also an issue if you are the only tenant on a cluster because also there you might have your own private important projects which run alongside build slaves, for example, which, which does run untrusted content. Another problem people run into is uh, Right, so I migrated like 90% of my workloads and they run great in containers. I don't worry that much about separation, but you know, what the heck do I now do about this specific workload? Um, so I'm, I was doing my kernel module testing and 
if I do that in my VM, somehow the, the node is crashing all my containers whenever there's something wrong with my kernel module. Um, or I got my, my old application, which is very much tuned to watch a specific si uh, chipset or a, or a hardware topology. I, I, cannot really, I cannot really create that environment in a container. Another thing is, for example, doing, doing testing with different operating systems. So I want to test my agent, which my company is writing, on Windows, but I also want to test it on FreeBSD, NetBSD, and I don't know, some Unix, Derivate, or macOS. I, VMs help me to do that. Containers don't help me to do that. So I think what I want to say is the more people move to containers, the more we see what containers cannot deliver to us. And that's where the community started to, to, to process, you know, to think, what can we do about these issues? Please look at that circle. <laughs> you all want to. <laughs> um, and they processed what they saw, and they looked at the problems, and they wondered, what can we do about that? And I mean, these two selected problems I just presented are surely just a subset of all the, I wouldn't say problems to see, but all of all the new things we learned about containers. It's just not that these two problems exist, but there are more. And depending on where you come from, you will see your, your problems in that container world. Like somebody with a networking background will have fun going to Kubernetes and looking how to solve fancy VNF problems. Right, but we continue to look at that circle and um, we continue to look at, the, at this problem scope from, from a KVM and Kuba perspective. And as outlined in the description of this talk, um, we're going to look at a few projects which now pick up uh, KVM and Kuma to address these two problems. So Carter Containers is named first uh, because it's actually building, and that's written in the last line, on um, three pretty old projects, which were Fracti, Hyper, Sage, and Clear Containers, and they merged because they were so similar. And they actually provide an isolation layer around containers. So if you've got an untrusted workload, you build a GitHub repository, right? Um, Carton Containers tries to solve that problem by, by wrapping this container in a QEMU VM, which is very convenient. Um, they actually drive quite uh, a lot of invention, which we'll get to in a minute. But the goal here really is to take a container and bring the security prop isolation properties we know from KV and QEMU to the container side. It, it has penalties, right? One big difference between containers and VMs is the boot time. Um, so how, how long does it take from the request until you have a really working environment you can work with? And Carter Containers initially suffered. They did a lot of good work to, to improve stock, well, to fork stock QEMU and modify it in order to speed up the boot process. A lot of good ideas came from that. And they also actively work on backpropagating these changes to QEMU to make it also available to other users which might require these features of having a more efficient boot process. Who of you uh, did work with Kubernetes before? Okay, that's not too many, but, but a few. So Kubernetes, as I said, is an orchestrator, and this is spoiler B. I will show you some syntax now or, or config file that defines how to run a container on Kubernetes. So um, a reminder for those who looked into Kubernetes, and as a general introduction who, to those who didn't look into Kubernetes, in Kubernetes, you define what kind of workload you want to run by defining the containers you want to run. So your whole application is inside such a container. Um, in general, the unit um, which is run on a Kubernetes cluster is a pod. So a pod is a group of whales traditionally, and because you know that 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 alignment between whales, that Docker image, and a group of containers. So I think that's where pod comes from. So a pod can can contain one or more containers, and I show this slide because this single line is actually deciding if you um, run your container untrusted in a namespace, in a regular Linux namespace on your host, or if Kata is jumping in and running it for you inside a Kuma VM. So the important thing here is what we spoke about early on, that workflow, right? With, I mean, the workflow for a user, what he's running is still a container. He's not working with a VM. He says, I want to run a container. So from a user perspective, 
if you think about what you would be doing, you would still be building containers, you would still be uploading or pushing containers to registry, and you would tell Kubernetes to run a container. In the <coughs> background, however, for you, a VM would be spawned in order to isolate that container at runtime. It's important because the workflow is not that a user is building some VM and pushing that to Kubernetes. That is not the case. The focus is really, really to secure a container. I might be repeating myself. So, all right. Next is Nemo, which is actually pretty, pretty fresh. Um, Nemo is, is a project, um, I don't know, which was brought up um, at last KubeCon, so earlier this year, right? Um, and it is about optimizing QEMU for, not necessarily for Kata containers, as I learned, but in general to optimize QEMU to, to be more efficient when it comes to boot processes, and that is supporting Kata. Why do I, why do I point out Nemo here? Because the talk is about, you know, what impact or how, what relationship do we have con between containers and KVM QEMU today? And Nemo is the result of that. Containers brought up the motivation to look at QEMU and see what can we change in order to meet aspects of containers which we don't have in QEMU KVM today, which is to be very efficient at, at booting, to be very quick, um, in order to be or to stay competitive. Yeah, and it came in that next slide because it, it was very closely related to Kata. All right. Another project which worries about KVM, but not QEMU, actually that's interesting here, is GVisor. So, G oh, by the way, all, all slides have that small paperclip icon down here. So if you want to learn more about a specific project, just click on that link in the slides, which I'll share afterwards, and you can find all the glory details. GVisor, as the prefix G indicates, was, was launched by Google, and um, they also wanted to address the problem of isolating untrusted workloads. So traditionally, they had an application engine called App Engine, Google App Engine, I remember now. And they wanted to allow to, to secure this workload. And they saw um, that's very hard to do with pure namespaces. So how do we do that? And GVisor is actually something like a, like a meta runtime for containers because it has different backends. Um, it has a sandbox, which is based on KVM. So all the syscalls are proxied through KVM in order to, to secure them. But there also is a different backend which is using seccomp to just filter out the, um, the syscalls which are not permitted and which is not using KVM. And then they have the propri proprietary approach, if I'm not mistaken, which is using the Google own uh, backend to do it in, in their data center. But my point is, even GVisor picked up KVM again because KVM provided more isolation primitives than the pure namespaces and see would provide of the stock Linux kernel. Another project, and this is project number one, two, three, four, right? Um, also picked up KVM and QEMU. And the pattern, we see it's emerging, right? They also look at isolation, isolating containers again. Um, they use they have, I mean, that's pretty much like Kata containers, right? They use QEMU and KVM to launch it around a container in order to secure it. The, um, the approach here is a little bit different because their focus is on keeping QEMU as it is. So Kata is really looking at providing all the features in a very efficient way, so to pass through block devices in order to get high performance, to really attach network interfaces in a high performing way, whereas run Q, is more looking at, at simplicity. So how can we make that simple? Also in order to make it portable, because if I'm mistaken, that is actually, uh, that comes from the background of um, the IBM Z series, if I'm not mistaken. So that might be even be able to run on a different architecture than x 64 But the motivation and goal is pretty much the same as the previous projects. And also how you run it, how you indicate is as we saw on the previous slide, you put an annotation on a pod in order to run that pod isolated. Now, the next project, Vertlet, is a little bit different. Um, Vertlet's a little bit different. So Vertlet has a different motivation. It allows you to run VM appliances with a container API using QEMU KVM. 
So Wordlet, again, is a project in the Kubernetes space. Um, it reached version one, I think, during this year or end of last year, um, and allows you uh, to run um, VMs just like you would run uh, containers. What does that mean? If we look at the um, definition uh, of a pod, which we also looked at before, you see that up here, the definition is still a pod, right? So to Kubernetes, it would mean the user wants to run a container. But because of this special annotation over here, um, it is telling Kubernetes, please use a different runtime for that container, which happens to be Wordlet. And Wordlet is then it, um, interpreting that spec part of that pod definition differently. So the image down here, which a regular container runtime would use, you know, it would go to the red Docker registry and pull down the image and then run it inside a container runtime. What Wordlet is doing is actually looking, it is understanding this image to be a regular QCOW or raw image. It would pull down that image, it would create a, a, create a, a QEMO instance and attach that image, wire up the networking, and you usually have some more specifications like, or you can set like amount of memory and number of CPUs, which is the regular pod API, and it would create the VM based on these informations. The limitation, however, of this approach is that you can only, and don't flame me if somebody from Wordlet is here, because I'll get to that. Um, the limitation is that the VM you are creating around this image is limited to what the pod definition can express. The best example is always live migration. So live migration is one of these features we have in the virtualization world. Who is not aware of live migration? Good. Or was there a hand? No. Um, live migration is not expressible because live migration does not exist in the container world. It's an anti-pattern over there, right? So there's no API to trigger or, or monitor a live migration. Um, another thing is, for example, ballooning or the type of graphical interface, you know, the, the kind of disk bus you want to use, all these nitty little features you need um, in order to make a VM suited for a specific guest, right? That cannot be expressed here. All what I said was not so true because in the end, um, they do support to provide certain configuration options in a wildcard annotation field. So you, for certain fields, you can say, I want to use a Vertigo disk bus by default, or I want to use, um, I actually don't know the full feature scope, but there are annotations which allows you to set certain parts of the domain definition. So they internally, they are also using libvirt. The benefit is that to Kubernetes, running a VM is totally transparent. So Kubernetes can take such a definition and would treat it just <coughs> like a container. And that is helpful because Kubernetes has constructs like replica sets, which is something like a scale group. So you can say, I want a replica set of this image. And if you increase the count to 10, then you will get 10 instances of that, of that image. So you would have 10 VMs <coughs> running on your cluster scheduled by the Kubernetes scheduler and that would be run <coughs> all alongside each other on that cluster on given nodes. So that is Wordlet. I hope the distinction is clear because a different problem was addressed. Yes, please, Niels. Um, <coughs> uh, oh, microphone. Um, can you still have uh, several images running uh, within um, a single pod as you could uh, with the um, classic containers? As far as I know, not, but I might be mistaken. There is also movement still there. Okay. Someone knows did a different answer on the details? No, okay, but so that is my last knowledge. But there's a link also on that slide before, so feel free to look there. Okay, cool. Um, and then, um, we have, oh yeah, that's the wrong slide, next one. Then we have Kubert. Oh, by the way, I always put logos there where a project had a logo, so it's not biased. Then there's Kubert, which is yet another project, uh, which <coughs> I happen to work on. Um, it allows you to run VM images on Kubernetes as well, uh, using libvirt, Q1, KVM. Um, in general, libvirt can be considered to be something like a, a clustered libvirt API as, as much as you can get it. 
Um, what does that mean? So that's really the other side of the spectrum, right? We said on the one hand side, it's totally transparent to users that VMs are used for isolation purpose. Here with Qbert, it's an explicit goal to, to give the user the explicit power to define what kind of VM will be created. So, oops. Um, so up here, um, previously in the kind, we always saw that it's about a pod, a group of containers or a container itself. Here it's a virtual machine instance. And the definition down here is also different. If anybody of you has happened to work with Libvirt, you might see some similarities. <laughs> so you can really define the devices, the disks, the disk buses, the number of CPU cores, the CPU topology sockets, and so on and so forth. So this is explicitly about defining the kind of VM you want to run in the cluster. Um, for Qbert, that is important because we say, um, Different guests, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, have different requirements on, on, the, on the virtual hardware it's running on, right? Um, out of the box, Windows will not support a virtual IO bus. You need to install the relevant drivers, then it will, but out of the box, it doesn't. There are some microkernel operating systems, and I know Andreas uh, is not here, but um, they require explicitly a virtual IO bus. So we want to give the, and, and the stated goal of Kubert is to allow to run every guest out there, every with a little star, which says as, as long as it's reasonable. I mean, there was a discussion about machine pumps and so on and so forth, but the goal was to give the user the power to define the VMs they need in order to run a specific guest and to give it really the, the level or the power a, as you have it in Libre. Um yeah, so Qbert uh, provides these guest templates in the upstream repository so that you can select Fedora or CentOS or um, Windows and, and the right API will be defined for you in order to launch a given image. Yeah, that's the difference. And here the stated goal is to run, to run a VM. By the way, you just not only run the VM, but because it's running on top of Kubernetes inside a pod, I mean, in the end, the pod is still the context in which the VM is running. Um, that VM can be integrated with, with the other pods running on that cluster, right? So it, could, it will speak to the same network, it can use the same storage devices, it can use the same infrastructure, um, just like all other containers, the different workloads on that cluster. By the way, that's also true for the other projects. As long as the container runtimes are installed on the cluster nodes, isolated pods and regular pods can be mixed and matched on, that, on the cluster. Okay. That's it. So far that were, those are not all projects, but I think some, uh, the larger and active projects. One important one, oh well, <coughs> it's not so much in the, no, that's, I think that's a good chunk of the projects. I think we're like six of them, which now mainly address the isolation use case or the traditional, more traditional VMs, which is actually outlined here. Darn, I should have taken out the legacy, right? That so, sounds so old, but after all, it isn't. To summarize, so Gvisor, Kata Containers, and Nemu and RunQ are rather on the isolation side, whereas Qbert and Vertlet are rather on the side to run VM workloads on top of Kubernetes. And all of them really rely on Qmu KVM in order to, to achieve their goal. <coughs> I think what I want to highlight here is also that, you know, before the container times, this was really the target, the use case of Qmu KVM. And I think what we saw now with this development in the recent years with, with the rise of these projects is that, that KVM and Qmu with, with the additional tooling actually you know, conquered a new use case, which is the container isolation, which is not just the isolation, but if you look from a user perspective, um, it's a different flow which allows us to leverage VMs, and that is the container workflow. You know, using that whole build chain to get stuff into an isolated, into a VM environment, that is what we actually gained from that change. Right, um, all of that is not just a one-way ticket. So it's not just that, that these projects consume stuff from Qmu KVM. You know, we, it's not just that, they, that it's used in order to provide value uh, to user, but it's also, it's actually enriching the discussion, right? So there are a few examples. Um, Kata containers, for example, is 
didn't have issues, but they looked at, you know, how can we improve sharing, sharing the storage, which was traditionally file system based in Kubernetes with the VM. So they, they started with an IP, if not mistaken, and then they, you know, continued that discussion to see, you know, how can we improve that stack in order to make it more efficient? What can we do? Does it make sense to increase, improve an IP or are there other, I think I now wrote down VertFS, it should have been NFS over Vert.io, if not mistaken. So, you know, they went into that discussion to see what can be improved. And in the end, the traditional virtualization stack um, gained these features, right? So it's valuable to other parties, the traditional users of the traditional virtualization solutions as well. Like Nemu um, fosters the discussion around firmware and devi devices about machine types. What can we do here to make that more efficient? I is there room to deprecate some stuff? Is that really still needed? Um, Qvert, for example, is more focusing on the higher level stack. You know, how can we make it more, how can we provide, um, how can we do the VM configurations right? Where can we store the information of how, how a VM needs to look to run a specific guest very good? How can we store that in a reusable manner? That comes, for example, from the Qvert side. And another thing, you know, re-architecting Libvert, which has also been done, not, not written down here, you know, to break it up into smaller components, um, Libvert Shimwork, um, is the keyword here, that is also coming from these new use cases. So I think the gist I want to say is, I think all that, all that demand which is coming from the container side is enriching the whole virtualization solution or the whole virtualization ecosystem um, even more, you know? It's making it more vivid. Um, obviously, obviously that is, leads to changes. So what's the takeaway? Um, in general, virtualization is here. It's still here and it's <coughs> going to stay. I think that's clear because what we see is um, first for the core virtualization primitives like KVM Kumo, it was clear that this isolation is something which is still desired, right? But also for VMs, you know, for that form factor of VM, I think it's pretty clear that this will also not go away. Containers cannot just one-to-one -one replace VMs, so they are here to stay. Um, the development of containers and the new insights into these workflows, into the applications which are running into containers, also have an impact on the KVM ecosystem, which might not be so straightforward if we go two years back. It was not so clear that, would, that there would be a positive impact on the development on Vert, on the whole Vert stack, right? But in the end, the new use cases probably shifted the requirements. So if we were on our, la our previous trails on the track we've been on with the traditional virtualization, we might have continued down a different path. So all these container workloads, use cases, workflows, they surely had an impact which, which might drive us eventually into different directions. Again, let me point out that Nemo, Nemo work, which I think is a highlight of, of how drastic um, these new requirements impact, uh, impact work. Right, and a little bit early, but that's it from my side, and there's some room for questions. I believe that every project you've talked about has a kind of one-to-one -one relationship between containers and VMs. Are there any, is anyone looking at putting multiple containers from one tenant into single VMs? Again, no, sorry, I, could you repeat that please for me? I believe that the projects you looked at have a pretty much a one-to-one -one relationship between the container and the VM. Are there any projects that look at putting multiple containers from one tenant into <coughs> a VM? Yeah, uh, I think I was not precise enough. I uh, apologize. So a specific, I know it for Kata. Um, so there multiple containers run in the same VM context. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that's explicitly the case. What about any project of uh Contain containers running alongside the current virtualization ecosystem? Um, the qu yeah, so Kubert allows you to do that, right? It allows you to run VMs. It allows you to run VMs uh, alongside, um, alongside containers and they can speak to each other. A different approach, uh, to be honest, is, is OpenStack Magnum, if not mistaken, which allows you to run containers on top of OpenStack. So there are different approaches if you look at that use case, you know, how can I orchestrate both VMs and <coughs> containers at the same time, then I would say Kubert today, Vertlet to some degree, and OpenStack Magnum would be, would be options. Hi, 
Um, a couple of years ago, there was a, a push to um, package up workloads in, in unikernel setups because people wanted to have the isolation of VMs but have a sort of single workload per VM. Uh, do you have any view on where that's going or whether that's just dead in the water because people prefer the flexibility of the container type workflow? So I think if I understood you correctly, then I would say Gvisor is more on that side, right? Because a Gvisor <coughs> is really for a single application and putting, th you know, isolating that single application. That is the one-to-one -one mapping. Um, a single application with KVM. So that is really, you know, is, is that... Is yeah, so I mean, the, the idea of a unikernel is you compiled your application as a kernel in, in one thing. So you didn't have a... a, a, a a guest user space to kernel to a guest kernel to host kernel transition. You just had one one operating level inside the VM. So, I at least had one guy um, who did that with a microkernel. I think what was it? Mach? No, it wasn't a Mach. It was one of the other. There, there, have, been, there have been several that have tried it. Yeah. But I've not seen a serious open source project um, which is doing that. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to clarify for the kata question or the um, tenant kind of question. It, it's the um, package granularity that you'd have is for a pod. So you could have multiple containers um, within a single uh, kata VM, but those that only be in the pod, you can't just say like tenant foo and you get this gigunzo VM and tenant bar the other. But but in that case, you know, you, you could just create a VM. Sorry about that. You know, and, and just schedule all your containers in that. Um, it'd be easier. Yeah, I mean that is yeah that's actually the solution we we otherwise see without VMs that that people create dedicated nodes for untrusted workloads or for tenants. Yeah. So there are basically two basic uh, metrics that uh, differ um, between containers and VMs, and at least to my opinion, and this is uh, startup time and uh, memory consumption. So startup time is, I did some measurements on that, some benchmarking, something like a penalty of currently 1,000 milliseconds or something. I guess you can reduce this by some degree, so this is pretty fine for me, but uh, the memory uh, footprint is uh, completely different. Uh, do you see any progress uh, on this issue in the near fu future on this subject? Yeah, so first today I would not take these two aspects to compare VMs and containers. But to answer your question, um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, no, I actually wonder about that whole, um, what's it, PMEM stuff, you know, uh, persistent memory, where, where you don't have that distinct, I mean, the problem is, right, which VMs have, is that there's this clear distinction between RAM, you know, fast memory, and slower memory. And I wonder if stuff like PMEM might, might you know, make that, make, it, make, make that less of an issue because the distinction does not need to be there. Does it make a sense? What I want to say is why I wouldn't say I wouldn't compare them on, the two, two, um, on these two uh, obje objectives is because in the end, to me, really, the distinction between VMs and containers is about the user workflows. It's not, it's not so much about technical aspects. It's really, I think, we need to measure it on, on the workflows. Um, that is what, yeah, <laughs> from a user perspective, what I think makes, makes the difference between them. But So just something I wanted to say is that there is an idea of how to bootstrap like container-like workload in a VM environment. What you do is basically you hold a VM that is already booted in suspend, and then you do a, like a fork memory by doing a copy and write on the EPT. And this basically gives you the container-like experience if you run the ex uh, workloads that are based on the same operation system that you hold on the side. This is similar to what uh, I think uh, Microsoft is doing with their, uh, I think it's called AppGuard uh, mechanism. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I, I, I agree with you, Fabian, about the fact that if you only look at uh, boot time and, and memory consumption, you're really reducing the differences between VM and containers. And 
the actual user workflow is is what really makes the difference between VM and containers. And you can do all sort of tricks to reduce boot time and everything. But packaging is is another uh, aspect of containers that you do not have with virtual machines. Uh, overall, the 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 way people use containers is very different. Uh, than the way they use uh, virtual machines, um, so it's it's not only be a, 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 it's not only about technical issues, and you can you can reduce boot time, you can reduce um, memory consumption, but there's a, a bunch of other technical uh, aspects that you have to to manage, which is how do I make a virtual <coughs> machine look like a container, yeah. and this is this is uh, this is probably eighty percent of the work that we did with uh, with Kata containers, twenty percent was how to make a VM boot fast and not consume too much memory. And the rest was, how do I actually make it look like a container to Kubernetes, to Docker, to all the uh, orchestrators out, out there? So it really is about the, the user workflow more than, than technical issues. And to answer the, uh, the memory consumption uh, uh, question, um, there's, it, it's not a binary thing. It's not uh, containers, bare metal containers consume less memory than, than, um, than VM containers, like Kata containers, because the advantage of virtual machine is that you control the uh, the guest consumption uh, from your hypervisor. Whereas with with Docker containers, you actually don't do that. You launch your container. If you launch 1,000 containers that do exactly the same thing, they're going to have a lot of duplicating memory across all the containers. Uh, whereas with with an hypervisor, you can play a lot of tricks to to reduce that uh, duplication, for example. And this is this is a, a, a common use case where. People launch uh, replicas of their pods and end up l running a bunch of containers that are almost identical and share a lot of, of uh, memory consumption patterns. So you can do m many tricks with uh, with your hypervisor to reduce that that memory consumption to the point where the bigger the container is in terms of memory consumption, uh, the the more interesting it is to run it in in virtual machines. So the offsets and the mm -hmm. delta decreases. Um, with with bigger containers, so it's not a black and white answer, and it's not it's not true that containers always consume less memory than than, than virtual machine. Just a second. <coughs> Regarding that, I'm I'm not sure that's true because like KSM, for example, basically what it does it just takes pages inside a host. Doesn't matter if it comes from containers or VMs. And do a copy and write on them, and and therefore you have the exact same memory reduction. Docker is not aware of this, and you have to make the community, the, the, the container community, understand that they could benefit from the, from that as well. The uh, a, a, a container memory is not marked as mergeable by anything. It is technically Sorry? possible, yes, but it's it's a it's a completely okay. different technical okay. um, issue. Sorry. Thank you very much for those insights and the vivid discussion. Is there anything which is different? <laughs> then thank you very much for your time and enjoy your stay. Thank you.